Gustav Vasa, one of the most important, if not the single most important person in the history of Sweden. The father of the nation, a man who preferred to build up the nation's economy rather than participate in wars, but at the same time a tyrant, a man who would turn his back on his supporters as soon as they served their purpose and those who incurred his anger would very soon curse the day they were born. But the fact of the matter is, he was never supposed to be the king. Mm -mm. Granted, he came from a very significant noble family, but he was meant to inherit and administrate his father's goods. So, how come he became the king of Sweden? Let's find out. First, we need to mention the Kalmar Union, the union of three Scandinavian states, Sweden, Denmark and Norway. And it is worth mentioning that Denmark was the dominant party within the union. And in the final days of this very union, there was, there was a conflict between the king of Denmark, Christian II, and the regent of Sweden, Stian Sture, the younger. Uh, one of the most successful battles for Stian Sture's alliance during that war was the Battle of Brandschurka in 1518. And according to the Romantic tradition, Gustav Vossa, the 22 year old Gustav Vossa, was the standard bearer in that very battle. However, it is very unlikely that he bore the standard because it was usually an established, successful soldier who did it, and you know, Gustav Vossa was, was just a rookie. As a matter of fact, he never became much of a military man. It was economy and administration that he excelled at, and we can very well assume that he just tried to stay out of harm's way during the entire battle. A year and a half later, the Swedes suffered a major loss. Their leader, Stian Sture the Younger, perished in the Battle of Burgesund. His wife, Christina Nils' daughter, continued to defend the Stockholm Castle for a couple of months, but eventually she had to give it up in exchange for her amnesty. Christian II stood victorious. On November the 4th, he was coronated as the King of Sweden, and all the most important noblemen in the country were present, all by one. Gustav Eriksson, later known as Gustav Vossa. Why didn't he come? Well, basically, he hated Christian's guts. And it had nothing to do with patriotism, because such thing was still pretty much non-existent in those days. It was totally personal. Two years before, during the peace negotiations between Christian and Stian Sture, Gustav served as a peace hostage of sorts. But he was guaranteed full safety. Well, Christian proved not to be a man of his word. He uh, captured Gustav and five other Swedish noblemen, took them to Denmark and imprisoned. Um, Gustav remained down there for over a year until he managed to escape to Germany. But it should come as no surprise that he didn't feel like coming to Christian's coronation. However, even without Gustav, the coronation did take place in Stockholm on November 4, 1520, and there was a huge party which went on for three days. And on November 8, Christian summoned uh, numerous Swedish noblemen, the noblemen which he had previously given amnesty to, and in a true Game of Thrones fashion, he uh, sentenced them to death and executed on the following day. This very event is known as Stockholm Bloodbath. When the news reached Gustav, he immediately understood that he found himself in a serious predicament. He was obviously supposed to die in the bloodbath as well, and Christian would obviously send his soldiers after him. At that time, he stayed in a village called Trefsnes, some 30 miles southeast of Stockholm. 
Knowing that he had no time to lose, he set out on his famous journey to the province called Dolana. His goal was to find supporters among uh, Dolana peasants. And by the way, there is a contemporary cross-country uh, ski competition called Vosa Lope, the Vosa Race, uh, which is inspired by that journey. But the fact of the matter is, uh, the route of the race back in the 16th century was overgrown with trees, bushes and whatnot. So it, it, it definitely isn't the same uh, route that Gustavo Sa chose 500 years ago. Well, anyway, according to the romantic tradition, he had a big epic journey filled with adventures like this one. On this uh, painting from the 19th century, you can see uh, Gustav and a peasant woman called Tom Margit, uh, who has given him a place to sleep, and now they can see Danish soldiers approaching her cottage. And what do they do? Well, Tom tells Gustav to go down into the, uh, the cellar, and she covers him with a top. Then, according to the tradition, the Danes enter the cottage, and they see a tub placed upside down in the middle of a room and they never ever come up with an idea to check what's under it. Well, guess you don't need brains when you have a hygge, right? Well, okay, Gustav eventually makes his way to the village called Mura when he gives a famous speech to the peasants telling them about the evil Danish king and why they should support him instead. And the peasants don't give a flying duck. To them, Gustav is a no-name, they have never heard of him, and why the hell would they leave the, the fields and follow him? Why? Needless to say, Gustav is completely disappointed, and so he decides to continue his journey west, cross the Norwegian border, and disappear forever. And it probably would have been the case if it wasn't for a messenger who comes to Mura soon after Gustav has left. That messenger tells the peasants how big an a-hole Christian is, how he wants to introduce new taxes and forbid the peasants to possess weapons. They immediately realize that a no-name is better than an a-hole, so they send two of their fastest skiers to trace Gustav and to fetch him back to Mura. Then they proclaim him the governor of Dolana and decide to join him in his war against Christian. Uh, from that point on, Gustav's peasant army grew and it even managed to recapture some important towns like Uppsala and Westeros, not to be confused with George R. Martin's Westeros. However, in order to siege robust castles, he needed a professional army and powerful allies. In order to accomplish this, he formed an alliance with Bishop Hans Brask. And this is where Gustav's craft really came into play, cause the price for the bishop's help was Gustav's promise that he would protect the Catholic Church as long as he lives. Six years later, in 1927, Gustav carried out the Reformation and stripped the Catholic Church of all its power and wealth. Well, that's just the kind of a Gustav he was, as his court and subjects would find out in the decades to come. Uh, back to 1521, with the bishop's support, Gustav got chosen as the regent of Sweden which automatically made him a member of the Privy Council. And obviously, if he chose to go to Stockholm and appear at its meeting, uh, he, he would immediately be beheaded. But as the regent, he started to draw new allies among the Swedish nobility to himself. Apart from Hans Brask, another factor which proved pivotal for Gustav's struggle for power was these contacts he made in Germany a couple of years back. As we've already mentioned, he needed professional soldiers in order to siege castles, and in such a case, German mercenaries were the way to go. So, Gustav went to the trade city of Lübeck and made a pact with its elders. 
Lübeck would uh, provide financial help and soldiers, but in return it would receive a monopoly on trade with Sweden and Finland. In practice, it took the Netherlands out of the equation. In 1523, the tides turned for Christian II. The Danish clergy and nobility, which have grown tired of his crazy ways and a lousy reign, decide on his deposition. A big chance presents itself for our hero Gustav. It should come as no surprise that he immediately capitalizes on it. In the summer of 1523, in the town of Strengnes, the parliament is summoned in order to proclaim Gustav the king of Sweden. Well, technically it is not a parliament because peasants aren't there, they are not present. Well, apparently, now that they have served their purpose, Gustav isn't interested in putting them in the position of power anymore. Anyway, on June 6 he gets elected and now we are not 100% certain that it was on that very day. There are different historical testimonies which give different dates. But the 6th of June is the one that has stuck, so to speak, and now it is commemorated as the National Day of Sweden. And that's pretty much it. After a short siege, Gustav takes over Stockholm and now, an upstart that he is, he has to establish himself as the ruler. But that's a whole different story. Thank you very much for your attention and I hope that from now on you will join me in my admiration for Gustav Vossa, the first king of the modern independent Sweden.